Welcome back to Lost Explained. In this part, we are exploring the mystical and supernatural elements on the show, and we shall be breaking down the show's depiction of both faith and the afterlife. I've already covered the origins of the island, the ancient past, the game between Jacob and the Man in Black, and the time travel on the show in depth in other videos, so be sure to check those out too if you haven't already. I wanted to explore the nature of the supernatural events on the show because there is a lot more going on with them than meets the eye. From the mysterious dreams that convey information and instructions, to the psychic powers that are demonstrated by various characters. From whispering island ghosts, languishing in purgatory, to metaphysical meeting points after death. These are the events and plot points that reinforce the idea that the island wasn't simply an island and that everything was happening for a reason. Throughout the series, the argument between faith and science was played out primarily between the characters of John Locke and Jack Shepard, and we saw evidence that there was absolutely reason to believe that Locke was right. Even Jack Shepard admits as much in the end when he tells the man in black, You disrespect his memory by wearing his face, but you're nothing like him. Turns out he was right about most everything. I just wish I could have told him that while he was still alive. And Locke wasn't the only man of faith. The show depicted the others as true believers as well, people willing to kill and die for the island and their beliefs. We often saw that they would follow orders without question if they believed that they were coming from their deity, Jacob, and they would perform archaic rituals purely out of tradition many of which they probably didn't even fully understand the origins of. We also see multiple characters following rules and performing tasks because they are told to do so, without knowing why or if there are even any real consequences to refusing to do so or breaking those rules. The button in the Swan Station came to define this very concept. Desmond pushed the button without knowing for sure that it was really saving the world, but he did so because he was told to by Kelvin, and Kelvin pushed the button before him because he was also told to. Neither man had any empirical evidence to support the claims that had been made in the orientation film, and the final occupants of the Swan, our Losties, find themselves wrestling with this very same dilemma. It's like Mr Echo tells Locke, The reason to do it, push the button, is not because we are told to do so in the film. Oh. Well, then what is the reason, Mr. Echo? We do it because we believe we are meant to. Isn't that the reason you pushed it, John? And that faith can often be tested by circumstance and doubt. But if you stay the course, it can sometimes be rewarded, and even validated. However, the show isn't simply about endorsing faith as the answer to all of the characters' problems. Yes, there were clearly supernatural and metaphysical things happening throughout the story, and an afterlife is clearly demonstrated to exist within the show's lore. But there was a dark side to all of this too, and I'm not just talking about the smoke monster. We can understand what the writers were really trying to communicate about notions of faith and belief through the character that embodied that theme the best. John Locke. Benjamin Linus says of Locke at his funeral the following. John Locke was a... a believer. He was a man of faith. He was a much better man than I will ever be. Locke was ultimately a tragic figure in Lost. He was a normal man who had lived a mostly unfulfilled life being a cog in a machine somewhere and playing games to pass the time. But it wasn't until he was preyed upon by Anthony Cooper and his kidney stolen that Locke really started to lose his way. He couldn't maintain a relationship after that. He couldn't hold down a job. Any light in his life was quickly snuffed out, and he became bitter and lonely and angry. And then he was put in a wheelchair by his own father, no less. And that very nearly was the end of John Locke. But the spark of something powerful ignited within him that day. A spark which carried him through the rehab and eventually turned into an idea. 
You know what you need, Mr. Lock? You need to go on a walkabout. Well, what's a walkabout? It's a journey of self-discovery. A motivation to keep living. To keep going. Locke came to view going on a walkabout as his ultimate destiny, something that might give some purpose to his seemingly menial and sad existence. What's interesting is that before Jacob's touch, we don't really get the sense that John Locke has any real affinity for fate, or that he's much of a believer in anything other than the things that he sees and feels around him, and many of his experiences have been hard and painful. But after his traumatic transformation, he becomes someone who wants to believe. Now here's the thing with Locke. Wanting to believe and believing are not necessarily the same thing. It would take something truly miraculous to turn this broken man into someone whole again. And after the island heals him, he finds himself humbled, validated, and empowered. And this finally gives him the purpose he has been seeking something that he had hoped the walkabout would do, only now the feeling is tenfold, because it makes him feel special, as if the skies had opened up and the universe had singled him out to say, you've been through enough John, here's your reward. This makes Locke commit himself to the island almost immediately, and we know on some level he is completely in tune with it. The relationship becomes almost symbiotic, because Locke is special, he just never had a chance to realise his own potential until he came to the island. So it is here, in this place, that Locke is reborn. All his years of training and preparation for the walkabout are put to good use, but there are some things that go beyond preparation. He becomes so simpatico with the energy of the source that he can sense changes in the weather coming. It's gonna start raining in one minute. Or know where to find people on the island like Jack. Take my hand. Dead. Or how to help those that are suffering. I'm proud of you, Charlie. Because who understands suffering better than John Locke? And so the man becomes a shamanistic figure to the group, at least for a while. He tries to guide them towards the realisations that he himself has already had about the island. You can't tell people about the miracles they have to experience them for themselves. The problem is that Locke doesn't fully understand the reasons for why these miracles are happening to him, or what it all means, or his place in the grand scheme, which makes him vulnerable to manipulation by third parties. All he wanted in his life off the island was to belong and be accepted by somebody, after a life of rejection. You're not wanted. This made him amenable for coercion, and the lack of acceptance within the core group of Losties, and the scarcity of answers on the island, are continually frustrating him, making him seek the answers in all the wrong places. We see his faith tested by people like Ben, and then totally used against him by the Man in Black. Locke gets tangled up between them and their manipulations. He is still searching for meaning and a reason as to why he's here, why he can walk again, and what he needs to do next. The show communicates to us the inner fears of John Locke. What if Jack gets everyone rescued before he can figure this all out? What if he gets dragged back to civilization with the rest of them and loses his ability to walk again? What if Anthony Cooper isn't done destroying his life? What if all the respect and reverence that he has found on the island as a hunter and provider is undone in the blink of an eye and he's back to working in a box factory and living his anonymous life? What if? What if? These fears and insecurities undermine him throughout the show, so he is determined to stay on the island as a result. Because here he is a somebody, here he is special. Miracles happen around him and to him, but back in the world, he feels like a nobody. This drives Locke to seek out confirmation of his faith, that he isn't just a nobody there by happenstance, that he has a purpose and a destiny, and that someone or something has a plan for him. John Locke's whole character arc is ultimately a cautionary tale about blind faith, and how that can lead people astray, because he is willing to do anything to demonstrate his commitment to the island, and other characters with ulterior motives help him to fill in the blanks. 
The man in black claims to speak on behalf of Jacob, and by extension the island itself. And Locke just accepts this, which allows this mysterious stranger to tell him what to do, even when what he is telling him to do goes against every instinct that Locke might have. That's the power of belief. And we see that Locke behaves like a zealot at times, willing to both kill and ultimately die for the island, even when he doesn't actually know the reasons why. He misinterprets instructions, like with the Beechcraft, and he follows false prophets, promising him the answers that he seeks, and this error in judgement is what leads to his demise. He was right that he had a destiny, it's just not the destiny he expected nor would have wanted. But Locke is also right about many things throughout the course of the show. He has instincts and intuitions, all of which are being guided by the source at the heart of the island. He understands something innate about what is happening to him, and to everyone, that he was meant for more than simply box factories and board games, and that his fellow survivors are there for a reason too. Each one of us was brought here for a reason. We see that he learns to commune with this great power, learning to read the signs in a way that most people can't. He has an impact on the island's vast history, sowing the seeds of his own legend, making the others believe in him through sheer force of will alone. He gives other people purpose and insight into themselves and their problems, helping them to reconcile issues from their past, and he plays an instrumental role in converting a man of science into a man of faith. Jack Shepard learns through Locke that the island is absolutely a place where miracles happen. Now, let's talk about how miracles happen, and more importantly, why they happen. I have discussed what exactly the light is in great detail on my video on the origins of the island, so I won't cover that ground again in too much detail here, other than to summarise the essential information. Basically, the source is the elemental force responsible for all of existence as we know it. Mother tells the two brothers that a piece of this light, a piece of this elemental energy, is inside of us all. If the light goes out beneath the island, it goes out everywhere including within us. In other words, if the light goes out here, both the physical world we live in would crumble, and the metaphysical world of the afterlife would fade away. So, the source's job is to keep the cycle of life and time everlasting, and it does this through influencing our everyday world, and getting people to help it self-sustain. When it does overtly communicate or intercede in people's lives, its actions are often viewed as either incredible coincidences, or outright miracles. For example, it healed John Locke's legs because John Locke had a destiny to fulfil in both the present day and the past, and he needed to be able to walk for both. If he was walking around in 1954, then he had to be able to walk again in 2004 and he could not be the man that he was, who makes the decisions that he does, unless he had suffered at the hands of his father, and been in the wheelchair for years beforehand. His kidney also needed to be stolen, because that's the only reason he survives Ben's gunshot wound in 2004. His failures were as crucial as his successes. Locke's life was by design, and both his life and death contribute to the island's need to self-sustain and keep the lights on. Now, there are several planes of reality that we need to discuss that are demonstrated on Lost. The first is the obvious one, the living realm, which is essentially the real world of the show where a majority of the action takes place. Then there is the realm of the dead, which is depicted in the form of the Flash sideways a plane where the rules of the living world no longer apply. But there is also a third plane of existence that operates somewhere between these two realms, a purgatory-like state that forms connective tissue to help the living and the dead communicate across the planes of reality. The island is a nexus point for all three of these realms. In other words, the island is an Axis Mundi. So what exactly is an Axis Mundi? Well, it's an astrological and mythological concept that has been around for a long, long time. An Axis Mundi is considered to be a focal point on planet Earth, 
that connects to both heaven and the underworld, linking them all together. And this axis is what all of existence revolves around. We know that co-creator Damon Lindelof has a particular interest in this concept, as he explores it again in his follow-up show The Leftovers. In fact, there is a whole episode named after this very concept. The term Axis Mundi is never actually used in Lost, but we can see evidence of it in how the story plays out. In the Lost universe, it is represented by the island and the awesome light at its heart, what Mother calls the Source. The Source is responsible for all realms of reality and keeps everything in balance and in check. You can view it as the source of the universe and the Big Bang, if you're more scientifically minded, or you can view it as something tantamount to a creator, like God, if you're more spiritually minded. The source keeps the realm of the living alive, and it keeps the realm of the dead eternal, but it also keeps a space open between the two in order to maintain a symbiotic balance, and that's where the island comes in. In the living realm, the island is in the ocean, always moving location and kept shielded from the outside world. In the realm of the dead, it's at the bottom of the ocean, static and dormant, the total reverse, because we are now on the other side of the light. So the heart of the island essentially forms a gateway that connects all of this together, just like the Axis Mundi. Certain characters in the show can access the power of the source, either consciously or subconsciously. If you have a deep connection to the light, you become a lightning rod of sorts, able to receive the frequency that the source is broadcasting on, and this communication manifests in various forms throughout the series. The first one I would like to discuss in detail comes in the form of dreams. It was a dream, but it was the most real thing I've ever experienced. What exactly are dreams? They are defined as a succession of images, ideas, emotions and sensations that usually occur involuntarily in the mind during certain stages of sleep. At their neurological core, dreams are simply electrical impulses in our brains. The human brain consists of billions of neurons, and these electrical impulses are sent from neuron to neuron, which enables messages to be transmitted in your mind. So, if the source is what powers human consciousness, then the source is also what generates these electrical impulses, and this is how it communicates to people subconsciously whilst they sleep. All the dreams throughout the show have the same aloof, uncanny quality to them in which characters appearing to the dreamer don't behave as normal. That's because they are ciphers for a message that the island is trying to communicate to them. We see multiple characters experience both prophetic and instructive dreams, hallucinations, and visions. We're going to go through all of the significant ones and explore their various meanings, but first I would like to address what I believe to be a common and divisive misconception up front. Some fans believe that the Man in Black was responsible for giving the dreams on the show, and this is primarily because of John Locke's dream in the Season 4 episode Cabin Fever. The nature of the information imparted from Dream Horace Goodspeed suggests this connection exists because Dream Horace tells Locke that Jacob has been waiting for him for a long time, and that by finding Horace's body, and therefore the cabin, Locke will also find Jacob. Now we come to discover that the man occupying the cabin is not actually Jacob at all. It is in fact the man in black. So this dream is assumed to be a key part of the Man in Black's long con, that he was invading people's dream space to manipulate them into doing his bidding. Some of the dreams on the show certainly work with this interpretation in mind, but I have several key issues with this theory. The first being that every single power that the Man in Black has is eventually revealed or confirmed in some way in Season 6. I have previously discussed the nature of the smoke monster's powers in great detail in my video on the ancient past. At no point is it ever demonstrated that the man in black has the power to manipulate people's dreams. This is just something that we have to assume. Those that subscribe to this theory argue that Locke needs to believe that he is going to see Jacob, and that Jacob lives in the cabin. The problem with this notion is that Locke already believes that the cabin is occupied by Jacob because of the visit he had there with Ben in Season 3 episode, the man behind the curtain. What was that? That was Jacob. He does not need a dream for this information to be confirmed. All he needs is the location of the cabin itself, 
which has been moving around the island. So the only real purpose that the Horace Goodspeed Dream serves is to help John Locke relocate the cabin. I've previously discussed the reason why the cabin was moving in the first place, so that Locke would not find it until the timing was right. Once all of the pieces on the board were in the correct place. For example, if Locke had found the cabin when he first sorted out, and Fake Christian demanded that the island be moved right there and then, then the Oceanic Six would still be on it, and we know that they aren't supposed to travel through time with Locke and the other castaways, not for another three years. This destiny cannot be changed, and the island has a responsibility to make sure that things play out the way that they have to. This channel puts forward the idea that it is the island speaking to Locke through the Goodspeed Dream, for the purposes of triggering the next chain of events that will lead to this outcome, just as it did in Season 1 with the Nigerian Beechcraft, and Season 2 with the Pearl Station. We'll discuss both of those dreams shortly. If the Man in Black is indeed behind the Cabin Fever Dream, then why does Horace Goodspeed say to go and see Jacob at the cabin, but then, when Locke gets there, the Man in Black, whilst posing as fake Christian, contradicts this information? He says that he is merely speaking on Jacob's behalf. Why didn't fake Christian literally just say, yeah, I'm Jacob, in order to carry on the masquerade established in the dream? Why would he contradict his own lie like this? or needlessly complicate his already complicated long con? Why is this inconsistency within the same episode even there at all? I believe it's there because the information from the Horace Goodspeed dream, and the information coming from the Man in Black's own mouth, are from two entirely different sources. What connects them is that both sources are looking for the same outcomes, just for different reasons. The island wanted and needed John Locke to believe that fake Christian was an advocate for Jacob, authorised to speak on the man's behalf, because this meeting in the cabin is absolutely critical, because it's what ultimately leads to the frozen donkey wheel being turned, which creates the world-saving time loop. The Man in Black's loophole plan is ironically integral to all of this taking place. His whole plot to kill Jacob was 100% necessary in perpetuating the time loop. It has all been part of a causal chain of events designed to preserve existence as we know it, Jacob and the Man in Black made plans, but the island had a master plan. There are no coincidences or accidents in Lost. The island is the prime mover throughout the whole show. And if you subscribe to my interpretation of the source, then we know that human consciousness is forged within the source, and that the light has the ability to manipulate both the conscious and subconscious human mind. So let's cast our eye over to some of the other dreams on the show. The majority of them only make sense in context coming from the island and not the man in black. A lot of these dreams were premonition-like, often serving practical purposes in getting characters where they needed to be. Let's stick with John Locke for a while longer. His dream in Season 1 episode Deus Ex Machina features the Nigerian Beechcraft crashing and a premonition of Boone's fate. This dream was specifically designed to show Locke the way to the Beechcraft and to lead Boone to his untimely death. This tragic event leads Locke back to the hatch, where, in his grief and frustration, he bangs on the hatch door, crying to the heavens. I've done everything you wanted me to do, so why did you do this to me? And it is this commotion up above that inadvertently prevents a suicidal Desmond from going through with killing himself down in the swan. He was no longer sure if the world was still up there, and felt like he had lost everything. Locke's grief cured Desmond's grief. So this moment was crucial, because it actually saves the world. Had Locke not had this dream, then Boone would not have been in that accident. And had Boone not been in that accident, then Locke would not have returned to the hatch to beat on it with his fist. And therefore Desmond would have followed through on his suicide leaving the timer to count down to Armageddon. Remember, Desmond makes this clear in the season 2 finale Live Together Die Alone, when he tells Locke, Three days before you came down here, before we met, I heard a banging on the hatch door, shouting, but it was you, John, wasn't it? You say there isn't any purpose, there's no such thing as fate, but you saved my life, brother, so that I could save yours. <laughs> no, 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 none of this is real! Nothing is going to happen, we're going to be okay! This is also why the island communicates a secret piece of Boone's childhood to Locke. 
The dream apparition of Boone recites that Teresa falls up the stairs, Teresa falls down the stairs. Teresa falls up the stairs, Teresa falls down the stairs. Teresa falls up the stairs. Teresa falls down the stairs. And who's Teresa? And it is this strange nugget of knowledge that helps to convince Boone that Locke is absolutely telling the truth and is in tune with forces beyond both of their understanding. That makes Locke a man worth following, even into potential danger. The island then ensures that Boone will be the one to climb into the plane by taking away Locke's ability to walk properly. Notice how after Boone is sacrificed and the aforementioned chain of events have been set in motion, Locke suddenly has no problem walking anymore. The man in black could not have known about Boone's past because he never scans him. The man in black also didn't have the power to reverse Locke's healing. Only the island can do that. And perhaps more significantly, the point of that whole dream wasn't about finding anything at the beechcraft that would help to open the hatch. That's just what Locke mistakenly believes, another example of him misreading the signs. The point of that dream was to lead Boone to his death. It's like Locke said, Boone was a sacrifice that the island demanded. What happened to him at that plane was a part of a chain of events that led us here, that led us down a path, that led you and me to this day, to right now. Now let's discuss Mr. Echo's dream of his brother Yemi in the swan. This is another example of a dream being in service of the island's will. At this point in season 2, John Locke is more than ready to stop pushing the button, which we all know would have been a catastrophic error. The island needs to buy some time until Desmond returns on the sailboat, and finds the right motivation and the courage to turn the failsafe key, which is another crucial event that must happen. Echo's whole purpose on the island has been leading him up to this moment, to get him to step up to save the world until the key can be turned. Think about it. If our resident priest had not been given this dream, then Locke would have followed through on his impulse to stop pushing the button with no one to stop him, if only to see what would happen. Echo's dream was the start of this particular causal chain of events. If the man in black was trying to manipulate Echo here, we have to ask what was his goal? Because we know that he certainly doesn't care if the light goes out and the island is destroyed. He's too far gone too angry and jaded to accept the divinity of the island and the critical role it plays in our existence, which is why he tells Sawyer in season 6 episode The Substitute the following. That's the joke. There's nothing to protect it from. It's just a damned island. And it will be perfectly fine without Jacob or you or any of the other people whose lives he wasted. Yet the Yemi in Echo's dream says the total opposite. He tells Echo, The work being done in this place is important, Echo. It is more important than anything, and it is in danger. That hardly sounds like something old Smokey would say now, does it? This dream leads Echo and Locke to the Pearl Station, and what they find inside causes Locke to lose his faith. Every single second, of my pathetic little life is as useless as that button! But it helps Echo to regain his. I believe the work being done in the hatch is more important than anything. If you will not continue to push the button, John, I will. This discovery guides Echo into becoming the interim button pusher, someone who will hold the line for a little while longer, but it also causes Locke to destroy the computer shortly after, and this is what necessitates that Desmond turn the failsafe key. So, do you see how these dreams drive the chain of events towards predestined outcomes? The island doesn't force anyone to do anything, it is simply leading and guiding them down a pre-forged path. In Cabin Fever, Ben indicates to Locke that he used to have dreams. We can assume that he means that he was also receiving guidance and instructions in what to do with his decision making, at least for a while. This line suggests that the island was also influencing Ben's actions in the same way, 
shepherding Ben towards his own destiny that would see him turn the wheel, kill John Locke, and unintentionally facilitate the Man in Black's loophole. All events that were predestined to happen. We can also include in the dream category the drug-induced visions that both Boone and Locke experience as a result of hallucinogenic compound that Locke has created. This paste appears to be derived from local plant life or fungi. Each of these vision quests serve a specific character or plot purpose within the story. The first hallucination sequence that we see is with Boone in Season 1 episode Hearts and Minds. Boone's hallucination helps to divorce him from his obsession and emotional hang-ups with Shannon, and to refocus on helping John Locke with the hatch. The purpose of this vision is to cement his loyalty to the resident man of faith, and to ensure that Boone will be willing to go above and beyond to help him out, and we know where this leads him, and now we also know why. The next time we see the paste and a hallucinatory sequence is with Locke's own vision quest in Season 3 episode Further Instructions. Now this is a dream that helps get Locke back on track following his total rejection of fate and a higher power at the end of Season 2. The dream plays upon his guilt over Boone's death to guide him through some of the events to come. Let's break it down in the context of what everything in it could mean in retrospect. The construct of this dream is an airport a place of significance to our losties in both life and death. Dream Boone is essentially the voice of the island here, and it tells Locke that Charlie and Claire will be okay for a while. This could be read as a hint towards Charlie's approaching death later in the season, and also as a possible hint of Claire's separation from Aaron and her turn towards darkness in the future. We see Saeed, Jin, and Sun trapped in a queue, which, at the time it was written and shot, was clearly supposed to be a reference to their present dilemma on Desmond's boat, but can now also be seen in retrospect as foreshadowing that they will all die together in the same place at the same time. There is even a hint towards Hurley taking charge as a leader someday by being in charge of the check-in desk, taking names and deciding who gets to board the plane, and guess who is working security alongside him? That's right, Hurley's future number two in charge, Benjamin Linus. Dream Boon indicates that Desmond remains determined to run away from his own destiny by looking after himself. Another reference to Desmond's cowardice in the face of commitment, which we will see him confront as the series progresses until he finally takes control of his own destiny, with both hands. Other references to current events unfurling in Season 3 include Jack, Kate and Sawyer's hostage crisis on Hydra Island, under the thumb of Ben. But we can also view this menage a trois as being a foreshadowing of their ever-shifting dynamics with one another. A greater irony to this part of the dream is this will not be the last time that Jack and Kate are at an airport with Ben. Ultimately, the island directs Locke to save Mr Echo's life because the priest has a couple of more things left to do before he can be released from his contract with Destiny. Echo must provide Locke with the next link in the causal chain of events. The message on his stick, on its own, simply isn't enough. It needs context and weight to be noticed, and a convenient shaft of light. The stick leads Locke to the Dharma barracks, and to the submarine, but more importantly it leads him back to Ben. This vision quest reaffirms Locke's faith in the island, and gives him a willingness to follow its every instruction, something that will be very important later on. Now, let's look at Claire Littleton's rather prescient dream from Season 1 episode Raised by Another. This isn't really fair to classify as a dream, it's actually a nightmare. Claire encounters a seemingly ominous and malevolent version of John Locke, who sports a white stone eye and a black stone eye. Looking back, knowing what we know, this nightmare was almost certainly a window into Claire's own future. The island is forewarning her that she is one day going to be faced with an empty crib, and that she would have blood on her hands, and that she herself was going to feel the pull between the light and the dark, a darkness that would ultimately be represented and embodied by John Locke. Charlie Pace also experiences dreams that are ultimately premonitions. He has recurring nightmares of trying to save baby Aaron. One of the dreams even features Claire begging him to save the baby, 
baby's in danger. We have to save him. The baby's in terrible danger. Lo and behold, Charlie finds himself in the water, literally trying to rescue Aaron. And we know that not too long from this moment in Charlie's life, he will drown in the water whilst trying to save both Claire and Aaron by getting them off the island. Mr Echo eventually helps Charlie to interpret these dreams as having a religious significance, but we know that there is more to them than simply a sense of Charlie's Catholic guilt. Take notice of the white bird that flies out at Charlie, flapping its wings to freedom. On the one hand, this bird is symbolic of his own transformation from a drug addict to being clean and sober. On the other hand, it might be a premonition of something else. An act of love and faith that he will find himself bonding over with Claire in the near future. The religious iconography comes from Charlie's own subconscious. He might view his own guilt and suffering through the lens of Catholicism, and the island tends to play into people's own personal belief systems in order to communicate more effectively with them. We see this with both Locke and Mr Echo. Hurley has a dream based around food and the burdens that come with leadership. Perhaps this is more equivalent to an anxiety dream than anything island-led. Sometimes dreams can just be dreams but this one still has narrative relevance that extends beyond the episode that it features within. The dream is entirely based around Hurley taking responsibility for the group in some way. It is the first time he has had to really become a leader in something, and to make a decision for the good of everyone within his community. We know this will come into play much later in the series since Hurley is being groomed to become the protector of the island. It is his destiny, and this dream and his situation involving the food supply in the hatch is the beginning of that psychological journey of taking him from goofy sideman to capable leader. I think Hurley's dream is actually a great example of the randomness that can spill out of our brains during sleep. The island is communicating, but there is always the dreamer's own subconscious filling in the gaps. It might have meaning related to the past or current emotional states. For example, Hurley seeing the Mr. Cluck's mascot is still food related, both to his past working there and his present having to provide food to the people once again. While Jin speaking English to him could be seen as foreshadowing of... Dude, your English is awesome. You're speaking Korean. And Hurley knowing Korean could be a foreshadowing of him someday being able to communicate with anyone regardless of language, a little bit like Jacob. The point of all these dreams is that the source communicates both its will and intention to people, warning them, instructing them, preparing them for the future to come, or guiding them towards the fate that they must meet. We also know that the source extends its reach beyond the snow globe of the island, because there are several characters who experience dreams in the everyday world, dreams that influence their behaviours and choices, this is yet another reason for why the man in black cannot be the one instigating these dreams. He is stuck on the island, unable to reach beyond its bubble and affect the outside world. And yet we see that multiple characters are wrestling with recurring dreams and nightmares off the island, many of which have prophetic significance. Charles Widmore complains of being plagued by nightmares, which started up after sending the freighter to the island. This was perhaps the beginning of his turn towards the light. No doubt these nightmares occur shortly before Jacob finally pays him a visit. When did you start sleeping with a bottle of scotch by the bed? When the nightmares started. Elsewhere, Kate dreams of Claire, who warns her never to bring Aaron back to the island. And this intense dream sows the first seed of guilt in Kate's mind about leaving behind her friend. A seed that will flower into a full-blown motivation to go back for Claire, and to not bring Aaron back with her, because there's no place for him in the past. Speaking of guilt manifesting through dreams, Michael Dawson has both nightmares and daylight hallucinations like this too, only he dreams of Libby. This fuels both a suicidal impulse within him, but also the drive to atone for his actions. We can reasonably assume that Michael descended into suicidal thoughts as quickly as he did because of these dreams. The island was priming him for what it needed him to do. Meanwhile, his son Walt talks about dreams that he still has about the island, even years after leaving. The one that he describes to Locke is in fact a premonition of the smoke monster becoming Locke, and being surrounded by people who want to hurt him. I've been having dreams about you. You were on the island, wearing a suit, and there were people all around you. They wanted to hurt you, John. 
Good thing they're just dreams. But Walt uses the word dreams, as in plural, which means he has been dreaming about seeing Locke on the island more than once, possibly in different contexts, and that this has been happening for some time. Walt clearly has supersensory abilities that give him insight into the people and the world around him, and I think now is the right time to transition into the nature of psychic powers in Lost. There are many ways to view the powers that we see demonstrated in the show, but let me start by making this simple analogy. Let's think of the island like a radio tower that is broadcasting a frequency that only certain people can hear. Those that are tuned into that frequency can channel it through their bodies like a transmitter, and it creates vibrations within them like a tuning fork. Now, the show establishes that there are special people among us, those that have gifts. In the real world, they mostly go unnoticed, and their powers remain untapped. Some will be written off as frauds or hucksters, while others are deemed to suffer with psychiatric disorders, even though they're not crazy. They're simply feeling and reacting to the vibrations of the island's frequency. People with psychic sensitivity can be viewed as having a greater connection to the light within themselves than the rest of us, and they can tap into that reservoir of power in various ways, much like an island protector does, only they do this on a more subconscious level. They don't know how it works, or why it works, it just does. I've often seen some fans react with frustration that the psychic-related subplots of Lost never got properly explained, but once you start looking at the actual powers depicted throughout the series, you can trace a very direct line back to an obvious origin point for all of them. Think about the powers that the source itself demonstrates throughout the series. It can see the future. It can bestow visions and dreams upon others. It can move objects and people through both space and time. It can heal ailments and injuries. It can draw things towards itself like metal to a magnet. And it can commune with the dead and call upon them for help. And we see some or even all of these powers as being accessible to special people. Some psychics see the future. Many have dreams and visions. Others show evidence of possessing telekinesis and the power to draw in and harness different forms of energy. Which also gives some the ability to heal the sick. And there are also those that can communicate with ghosts and access the afterlife itself. Notice how none of the psychic powers mentioned here go against anything we see the source being capable of itself. It's all connected. Let's explore some of the people on the show who demonstrate that psychic connection, and who better to start with than... <laughs> One of the most common questions to be raised from the show that people often bring up is about Walt, and why he was so special, and why he was written out. Well, the practical production answer to this question is that the actor playing Walt, Malcolm David Kelly, was growing up too fast, and considering the first couple of seasons of Lost all take place within the space of roughly two months, it became clear to the writers that Malcolm's growth could not be easily accounted for within the narrative continuity, so they figured out a way to write him out of the story. As self-confessed fans of Stephen King novels, both Damon Lindelof and Carlton Cuse riffed on some of the author's works throughout the series, from the villainous Man in Black archetype of the Dark Tower saga, to children with psychic gifts in books like The Shining. And that is essentially what Walt started off as, a character akin to Danny Torrance. They had set him up as a boy with strange supernatural abilities that were vaguely defined in Season 1 because they were playing with the possibilities of where this story could go, and Walt was one of those possibilities. Unfortunately, the writers never found a way to wrap up his story in a conclusive way that satisfied the fanbase. It's only in the epilogue, The New Man in Charge, that we finally get a sense of what Walt's ultimate purpose was, but we'll get to that later. The point I want to make up top is this, Walt is not the massive unresolved mystery that many claim him to be. While it would have been great for the writers to bring him back for the final season to close out his storyline properly, 
the questions surrounding him and his powers have always been easier to answer than they might first appear. As the seasons went on, Lost showed us that there are characters within the story that have powers. Walt was special, yes, but he wasn't unique. He was one of many, some of whom developed before him, like Miles, and others who developed powers after him, like Hurley. Now these two fan favourite characters also demonstrated psychic abilities, and none of them have been saddled with the same legacy of unanswered questions in the way that Walt has. I mean, you rarely ever see anyone bemoaning the fact that we never find out why Miles is special and can hear dead people. I think this is a holdover from people who watched the show live back in 2004, and initially viewed Walt as somehow being unique in this way. But let's explore him in more detail. What exactly is happening with him, and what exactly are his powers? In part one on the origins of the island, I discuss how the source flows through a protector and imbues them with the ability to harness the properties of the light. They can consciously control and wield its powers through acts of pure consciousness and will. Walt and those who are like him can also do similar things, only on smaller scales. They just don't have the same control or awareness that a protector does. They might will things to happen around them purely by accident or on instinct, or as a reaction to their emotions and environment. In Season 5 episode Some Like It Hoth, we see that Miles as a boy has no real control over his power. It takes him years to master it, and even then it's hinted that he's only really scratching the surface of what he could do. When we meet Walt, he is also too young to have a control nor understanding of his abilities. Almost everything we see him do in the show that has a supernatural underpinning to it, seems to be occurring like a reflex or an unfiltered reaction. Most of his powers appear to correlate in some way to electromagnetism. Here are some examples. We know that birds have some kind of internal biological compass that helps them to follow Earth's magnetic field, which is an invisible field produced by the planet's rotation and liquid metal core. We see birds being drawn to Walt because his own energy interferes with their flight paths, drawing them towards himself, towards his inner light. Just like the island can disrupt flight paths and draw things towards itself. Walt doesn't realise he's doing this, of course, it's all happening on a subconscious level. In the jungle, we see Walt manage to hit a bullseye by throwing a knife. This happens after Locke gets him to concentrate and visualise the knife going into the stump in his mind's eye. Right here. Focus on it. Alright? Picture it in your mind's eye. You know what that is, right? The mind's eye? Like a picture in your head? Or... That's right. Now do it again. But see it. See it before you do it. Visualize the path. See it. For a brief moment, we see Walt gaining control over his power. His mind is focused, and therefore, so is his will and intention. When he throws that knife into the tree, he is essentially harnessing his inner light and releasing it. It's the same transfer and distribution of energy that we see taking place when the Man in Black's dagger is drawn towards the well in Across the Sea, only in this case, the energy is being channeled through Walt rather than just an energy pocket. Locke is the first person to really help Walt consciously tap into this reservoir of power. We also see Walt appearing in strange places throughout the series. Now these appearances have been the source of much debate within the fan base over the years. In my video on ghosts and apparitions on the island, I discuss the theory that some or all of Walt's appearances might actually be manifestations of the Man in Black. I explore the possibilities and inconsistencies with that theory within the video, which I shall add to the links in the description. However, for the purposes of this video, I would just like to run with the idea that all of Walt's appearances throughout Lost are actually him, and only him, and we can assess his appearances based solely on the interpretation that he has supernatural abilities. So, let's look at these appearances. After his abduction by the others, Walt appears to Shannon several times throughout the first half of Season 2. She comes across him in the jungle when looking for Vincent. <laughs> Walt? What are you doing here? I have some help for you. Help, sir. Shannon! What is it? 
Walt later appears again to her, this time in her tent. That was quick. And then he appears once more in the jungle, seconds before Shannon is shot by Anna Lucia. Do you see him? Whoa! The show actually gives us a straight up explanation for these appearances at the end of season 2 in the episode 3 minutes. Miss Clue asks Michael the following questions. Is he your biological son? What? Are you his father? Yes, I'm his... How old was he when he started speaking? I... He... Did he have any illnesses growing up? Headaches, fainting spells? What? No! I don't, I wasn't there. He, he was halfway around the world. Why are you asking me all these Did questions? Did ever appear in a place he wasn't supposed to be? You say he was halfway around the world, but did you see? I want my son. Now we really have to ask ourselves, why would she ask this question? It's so specific and so strange and so loaded with implications. It seems that the writers were communicating to us, at least at the time, that these appearances were related to Walt's powers. Because if Walt wasn't manifesting in different places whilst in the care of the others, then Miss Clue wouldn't have any reason to ask this question at all. The implication suggests that the others have been experiencing Walt's strange appearances for themselves. And this is why Ben tells Michael on the dock in the season 2 finale. I'm not happy about the arrangement that was made with you, Michael, but we got more than we bargained for when Walt joined us, so I suppose this is what's best. Now, I don't think Ben means that Walt was simply throwing tantrums. Their troubles with Walt is again further hinted at and reinforced in the mobisode, Room 23. He did it again. Did what again? You know. Well, you're going to have to tell him to stop doing it. I'm not going in there. Fine, get Beatrice. She's not going in there either, Ben. None of them will. Tom won't even bring him food. They're all scared. Look, Ben, his father is out there looking for him. We could bring him back. No. He's dangerous. Again, we have to ask, why are they scared? This channel believes that Walt's powers are getting more out of control because he's afraid, and he has the ability to draw in electromagnetic energy, then release it, which helps him to project himself across to the main island. When he does this, he is using the frequency of the source, and this is what is sucking birds off from their flight paths. There is evidence to suggest that Walt can shift through physical space, whether that be through teleportation, which is a power we know exists within the Lost Universe, or through some form of astral projection. We literally see Walt appearing in places he isn't supposed to be. We know that the others have been putting him inside Room 23 on Hydra Island. They know who they say they are. Walt! They're pretending! You want me to put you in the room again? Pretending? Pretending what? The original purpose of this room during the Dharma days was to interrogate hostiles, then wipe their memories. It appears that the others use it for similar purposes, but they've also reappropriated it to brainwash and condition their own people who step out of line or become troublemakers. If Walt is in that chair, being forced to endure that process, then he is in a hypnotic, trance-like state, the others are trying to calm him down and control his behaviour. And it's while he is in this hypnotic state that the boy begins to travel. Room 23 gives you sensorial overload, as we see in Season 3, when Sawyer and Kate go to rescue Carl. Therefore, Walt's ability to target people and places and present himself clearly to them has gone totally haywire. I have previously described this as a kind of psychic misfire. So what exactly is Walt looking for out there? Well, I think we can fairly deduce that he's looking for help and safety. He's looking for the familiar. And what do we know that brings Walt a familiar sense of comfort and safety? Vincent. Only instead of finding his dog, he finds Vincent's current owner and attaches himself to her. And this is why he appears several times to Shannon and attempts to communicate with her. 
Also notice how Walter's wet in some of these scenes, which appears to foreshadow the fact that he appears in the rain several episodes later just before Shannon is accidentally killed. All of Walt's psychic senses are firing at the same time in Room 23. He speaks in garbled phrases spoken backwards, all of which seem to be warnings. His first appearance warns about the button in the hatch, and he seems to have an awareness of the troubles that await our losties down there. This isn't the first time that Walt has warned about the hatch either. In the season one episode, Born to Run, Locke touches his arm and Walt gets a jolt, followed by a very bad feeling about what is going to happen once they open the hatch up. He tells Locke, Don't open it. What'd you say? Don't open it, Mr. Locke. Don't open that thing. What, what thing? What you... Just don't open it. We know that many bad things do indeed happen down in the hatch in season two but the most pertinent to Walt is surely the murderous actions of his own father. This is the event that changes the course of multiple lives, especially Walt's. So while the boy has a subconscious understanding of some of these events, he might not understand what exactly it is he is feeling or even possibly seeing. But the show makes a point of highlighting on several occasions that he does have the power of precognition. This is further evidenced by his messages to Shannon, later in Season 2 episode Abandoned. She sees Walt in her tent, and he is once again speaking in reverse. The reported translation of his backward speech is, They are coming, and they are close. This seems to be referring to his father Michael on his way back to the beach camp with the tail section survivors. Walt's projections ultimately feed into a tragic causal chain of events that lead to Shannon's death but also ironically lead to Anna Lucia's death too at the hands of his own father a few short weeks later. Everything is connected. We see Walt appear on the island again, long after he has been taken off of it. This time he appears before Locke at the Dharma Pit in the season 3 finale. Only here he looks taller and older. Now obviously this was due to the actor's growth spurt in real life, but within the show his older and taller appearance is acknowledged. What the hell do you mean you saw Walt? In a dream? No dream, it was Walt. Only taller. Taller? What, like a giant? The argument can be made that Walt is once again travelling subconsciously. He is appearing there on behalf of the island to help Locke find his way. If Locke could see and speak to ghosts like Hurley, then the island might have sent a whisper as a messenger, but because Locke doesn't have this power and there is no time for a well-timed dream, the island must find someone else to deliver its instructions. Also think about the motivation as to why Walt, in some astral form, wouldn't want the freighter to come to the island. Could it possibly be the chain of events that will lead to his father's death on that very same freighter? You can go now, Michael. In season 5, Walt does confirm to Locke that he has been having dreams about both him and the island, which might be how he travelled and communicated with him there in that scene at the Dharma Pit. These might merely be weird dreams or strange feelings to Walt, but to other people, these events are as real as the boy actually being physically present. Walt's psychic abilities were erratic in nature, because they were underdeveloped and untrained. He was too young, and he was often being used as an instrument by the island to further the causality of certain character trajectories or events. As he gets older, with the right mentor, he could learn to harness the light within himself to better control these powers, and one day he might be able to use them properly, just like Jacob. And this leads me to the new man in charge. In this epilogue for the series, Hurley and Ben come to Santa Rosa to bring back Walt to the island, and it is heavily implied that Hurley has Walt lined up to become his successor as the next protector, once he is older and a little bit wiser. This is what makes Walt special beyond the psychic gifts. The island always wanted Walt. Just like Hurley and Jack before him. Just like Jacob and the man in black before them. His purpose was to someday carry the torch lit millennia ago, to continue guarding the gateway, and it is there, back on the island, that he will finally reconcile his abilities with the role he was destined to take over from the day he was born. Let me talk to you about a job. There are numerous other characters whom we meet that appear to possess supernatural gifts, and much like Walt, these people have a strong link to the source and a subconscious awareness of the light within. 
Isaac of Aluru claimed to be above a place of great energy that was geological and magnetic in nature. He also claimed to be able to harness that energy and channel it into others to heal their illnesses and ailments. There are certain places with great energy. Spots on the earth, like the one we're above now. Perhaps this energy is geological, magnetic. Or perhaps it's something else. And when possible, I harness this energy and give it to others. He is referring to hot spots of electromagnetism connected to the source at the heart of the island. Isaac's attempts to heal don't always work because he is simply an instrument. A char or a Fouquet might have powers too. It's never fully defined in the episode Stranger in a Strange Land, but she appears to be able to read the inner light of a person, to see their soul and tell them who they really are. Perhaps in a similar way that Dogen can read a person to see how bright or how dim their inner light has become. Achara is revered for this within her community, and her power is viewed as sacred. Hugo Reyes, aka Hurley, develops the ability to see and speak with the dead. We'll explore him in greater depth later in the video, along with Miles Strom's power that also allows him to tap into the afterlife. The point is, the show alludes to multiple people spread around the planet, all of whom have some kind of deeper communion with the light that exists within them and others. But we also see people who are obvious frauds, such as the fake psychic that Hurley's father takes him to see. The mystic arts are not subject to bribes. How dare you! Ten thousand. Your dad put me up to it. And then there are other more ambiguous portrayals that have had fans in heated debate for years. One that comes to mind in particular is Claire's psychic, Richard Malkin. How does it work? I don't know. Claire Littleton visits a so-called psychic in season one episode, raised by another. There are some fans who believe that Richard Malkin was a con man, while other fans believe that his gifts were totally real. But the show wanted to keep the nature of Malkin relatively ambiguous by presenting us with two possibilities. The first possibility is rooted in the scepticism of the real world while the other possibility is rooted in the magic of a world beyond our understanding. However, the supporting evidence within the show does ultimately lean more towards one explanation over the other. Let us begin by deconstructing the theory that Richard Malkin was indeed telling Mr Echo the truth in Season 2 episode question mark, that he is a fraud who cons people for a living by pretending to be a psychic. We can apply this very logic to the way we analyse season one episode raised by another. Richard Malkin presents to his customers as a psychic according to what he told Mr Echo. Then he gathers intelligence on these customers and exploits it somehow. But we know Claire comes to the psychic of her own accord. It's a drop-in visit arranged through her friend. Some people have actually suggested that Claire's friend Rachel must have been involved in the scam in some way, although nothing in the scene or the friend's behaviour suggests this. In fact, the very idea that Claire's girlfriend is involved in what becomes the most needlessly elaborate con ever is implausible in the extreme. Basically, there is no way that Malkin could have anticipated that Claire Littleton was coming to see him, and therefore no way he could do advanced research. In other words, there's no way he could know that she recently found out she was pregnant. Perhaps a very capable cold reader could pick up on this fact if a woman was showing early signs of pregnancy, but Claire isn't at this point, she only recently found out. If it's a simple guess, then it's got to be one of the most lucky guesses in con game history, because it's the first thing that Malkin observes. Huh? So when did you find out? What? About the baby? Um, two days ago. Then he claims to see something that supposedly unnerves him during the first reading, and this ultimately leads him to turning Claire away. He even gives her the money back. Now, if he's conning Claire, what exactly is the point in doing this? Is he hoping that Claire will be intrigued enough by his rejection of both her and her money that she will return for another reading? Because until her life goes pear-shaped much later on, she had absolutely no interest in coming back to find out anything more. 
So if this first reading was supposed to be bait on a hook, it doesn't work. But let's continue playing out the logic behind this all being a scam a little bit further. When Claire does eventually return for another reading, following the breakup of her relationship, she tells Malkin how she plans to give up the baby for adoption. Well, it appears that conman Malkin is in luck, because her revelation surely now gives him the absolute perfect opportunity to capitalise on this. He can now trigger his secret plan to influence this naive Mark to sell her baby to a specifically chosen couple so he can make a profit. After all, his Mark is now more than willing to cooperate. Claire is ripe for being taken advantage of right here. Instead, Malkin does the complete opposite. He tells her that she herself must raise the baby. In fact, he insists on Claire raising her own child so aggressively that he actually freaks her out and scares her away. Great. Um, thanks for taking my 200. No, 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 take it. Miss Littleton, I am begging you just to consider. I can't raise this child by myself. You have to listen to me. Okay, thanks for your time and my money. Miss Littleton, please. The baby needs your protection. Miss Littleton! He then continues to harass Claire with late night phone calls for months on end, which could very well have seen Claire call the cops on him and have him charged with a crime. I'm sure the local police would have been familiar with a local con man like Malcolm, if he is indeed a con man. And what is he telling Claire in those phone calls? He is still insisting, in fact begging, that Claire must keep this child. Ask yourself, how does any of this benefit Malkin? Where is the logic in this scam? Why wouldn't he simply introduce the idea of letting him find the right couple for her baby to be safe with? He is doing nothing here but driving Claire away even further. In fact, it's only after Claire is struck by a moment of intervention from the island itself during the adoption signing that she returns to Malkin to finally hear him out. If this moment of fateful intervention had not taken place, then Malkin, the fraud, would have torpedoed his own ridiculous plan. The island is communicating to Claire via these signs to make a different choice, to go back to Malkin. And what happens when Claire does come back to him? Well, this alleged con man has now done a complete 180 degree turn, because now he recommends that Claire give the baby up for adoption. If he simply wanted to make some money by brokering a deal between Claire and an adoptive couple, then why did he spend so many months sabotaging that very plan by telling his Mark to do the total opposite of what he wanted her to ultimately do? Driving her away to a local adoption agency, no less. It makes no sense. Just think about it, Claire literally almost signed the baby away to someone else whilst Malkin fumbled through this sloppy, nonsensical, convoluted scam. His actions in these flashbacks are totally illogical if we are to truly believe he is a fraud. If an expert con artist like Sawyer had heard about this plan for a long con, he would have most definitely slapped Malkin across the face for thinking up something so silly. What's happening? Oi! Claire was right the first time when she realised that there was no couple waiting in LA to adopt Aaron. So, what explanation does make sense here? Well, we know that the series establishes that psychic abilities are absolutely legitimate, and we meet various people with supernatural gifts throughout. Or we see characters exhibit a degree of psychic sensitivity with untapped potential. These gifts may vary, but they absolutely exist within the Lost Universe. Malkin's abilities are perhaps more closely aligned to those that we see Walt demonstrate in an early form. The scene when Walt warns John Locke about the hatch after they make brief contact is almost the exact same mirror scene of what takes place between Claire and Malkin during the first reading. Physical touch is an important recurring motif in Lost when it comes to the activation and transfer of power. The source uses those with psychic sensitivity to help shepherd people and events along a certain path. Psychics are one of many tools available to it to get people to where it needs them to be within the tapestry of time. Did Malkin know the specifics of Claire's future in its totality? No. No one person can see or predict everything. But he would have felt the gravity and urgency of this intuitive feeling from within. Even though he couldn't fully articulate it, Something within, and beyond him, is guiding his actions. And for the next few months, he is driven by this feeling to get Claire to where she needs to be. 
So it follows that the only reason Malkin told Mr. Echo that he was a fraud was to get rid of the man. He knows that Echo, a priest of all people, would never accept the truth about psychic gifts and precognition. Furthermore, Malkin did not want to become a media spectacle with his family being investigated by the church. Who knows how that would impact their lives? Malkin even goes on to claim that the miracle that happened to his daughter, the miracle of resurrection, wasn't a miracle at all, and that he is a fraudulent psychic being punished by his wife with this tall tale. No, you don't understand. She came back to life. We were out in the back blocks, and Charlotte must have slipped, and she went into the river, and she's not much of a swimmer. She was dead, and the next day, she woke up. She fell into a mountain river. Her body shut down, she went into hypothermia, which made her appear dead. And why is your wife so convinced that way? Because she's a zealot. Except, we know that his daughter did genuinely die and come back to life. Not only do we hear the incredibly unsettling evidence of it from the coroner's own tape recording, and his legitimately haunted reaction to it, but it's further proved by Charlotte Malkin herself. It's clear from what Charlotte tells Echo at the airport that she had spent time in her own version of the Flash Sideways, in which she met Yemi, and Yemi told her to take back a message for his brother. If this wasn't true, how could Charlotte possibly know about Yemi? Echo is incognito. No one knows who he really is. Charlotte tells Echo... Says you were a good priest. Who says that? Yemi. Speaking about my brother, it's not a joke. So you should be very careful what you see next. I saw him when I was... Between places. He said that you would come and see me. He said that even though you were pretending you were a good man. Who put you up to this? Did your father tell you to do this? He wants you to know that he will see you soon. He said that even though you don't have faith in yourself, he has faith in you. Now I'm pretty sure that this message from the Flash Sideways is what motivates Mr. Echo to do what he does on the island. Rather than be an everyman for himself survivor, which would have been more in keeping with who he had been up to this point, Yemi's words, through Charlotte as a proxy, lead Echo into being a helpful, compassionate, heroic, and valued member of the tail section. And this all helps to reaffirm his faith in himself as a man of God and a man of purpose. Also, Yemi's words that Echo would see him soon were initially thought to be referring to the Yemi we see in the dreams, or even the fake Yemi that we see on the island in season three but those words from the afterlife actually take on a sadder, more prophetic context looking back. Echo would see his brother soon, because he had not long left for this world. What Charlotte Malkin experiences is much the same as what we see Desmond experiencing in season 6 when he is zapped by the electromagnetic blast. So, if this miracle did legitimately happen to Malkin's daughter, and we know that psychic gifts are in fact real in the Lost Universe, then why can't Richard Malkin's powers be genuine? Remember, a key to understanding Lost is to always measure a statement made by an unreliable character against what we see them do. And we see Richard Malkin directly lead Claire to the island based on a feeling, an intuition, something he himself is struggling to verbalise. The context of the scene in Season 2 episode question mark must also be measured against the on-island narrative of the time. At this point in the show, the writers wanted us to question Malkin's authenticity, without confirming whether or not we should dismiss him altogether. The reason this scene with Echo exists, narratively speaking, is to mirror the themes of Season 2. The question Season 2 wanted us to ask is, what is real and what is fraudulent? The Pearl Station makes Locke question everything he thought he believed about the button, making him doubt his own faith in a higher meaning and purpose to his life. However, this same revelation actually reaffirms Echo's own faith, and serves to make him a true believer. Both men read the same text completely differently. The Pearl's orientation video creates doubt in Locke, in the same way Malkin creates doubt in Echo, and by extension, us as an audience. We are offered up a real-world, sceptical explanation behind an ambiguous mystery that might otherwise have had more fantastical underpinnings. 
Is Malkin really a psychic? Is the button in the hatch really saving the world? At the end of season 2 we finally learn that yes, the button is saving the world. The show wants us to understand that even the most seemingly fantastical explanations are absolutely plausible, even if we don't fully understand them yet. Now, there is an alternate take of the Malkin Echo scene available on the Season 2 DVD, which sees Malkin tell Echo that he was paid $16,000 by a couple in Los Angeles to convince a pregnant girl to board a plane. Now, this version of the scene never made it into the final cut of the show, and therefore is not canon. It was deleted for a reason. Probably because the writers wanted to leave the ambiguity intact, and possibly because they also realised that for Malkin to be a fraud, it might undermine the events of Raised by Another, as already discussed. So, what exactly happened to Malkin during Claire's first reading? He later explains that he saw something that scared him, and described it as being blurry, and blurry indicates something bad and inexplicable to him. In the second reading, he probes further into this feeling, and for reasons that Malkin cannot fully articulate, he senses that Claire's baby will be in grave danger without her in its life. The island, aka the Source, is guiding him in the same way it later guides Desmond with the flashes of Charlie's various deaths. In the same way it guides Locke through dreams that lead him to where he needs to go next, and in the same way it guides Hurley via the ghosts of those that have died. Over the course of the next few months, Malkin receives very specific information that he needs to impart to Claire. We do not know in what form this information comes to him, but it could quite possibly be through dreams, which is why he calls her in the middle of the night, because he's just woken up from one. Regardless of how the information is conveyed, he now knows that Claire must board a very specific flight on a very specific day, and this is why he is so adamant about 8.15. If there was a couple in Los Angeles waiting for her, then the flight could have been at any point that day or even that week. It certainly wouldn't have needed to be that particular flight and no other. Yet Malkin insists that it must be this flight. He might not know why this is so essential, he just feels that it is absolutely imperative that Claire gets on it, and by the time Claire comes back to him ready and willing to listen, he knows the only way to get her on that flight is to change tact and embrace the adoption narrative, playing into Claire's ambivalence about the baby, and he already has the ticket ready for her. That in itself is very telling. He knew to book that specific flight without any sign or indication that Claire was going to come back to see him, almost as if he has some kind of psychic intuition. So Claire finally agrees and follows Malkin's instructions to the letter. The island influences whatever it can, wherever it has to, in order to channel events towards their predestined path. Claire's path was to go to the island, so she could participate in the Grand Tapestry of Time, and ultimately raise her son safely in the future once the world had been saved. Perhaps as a karmic reward or through a twist of fate, Richard Malkin is given a second chance with his own child after she is returned from death. Charlotte Malkin's resurrection validates the existence of the supernatural, and her father's work in helping people get to where they need to be. Some fans have suggested that Jacob might have been pulling the strings behind Richard Malkin, that Jacob was the one to bring Charlotte back from the dead, and in exchange Richard Malkin would execute this crazy convoluted plot, but Jacob makes clear, and the show makes clear, that he cannot bring people back from the dead, he can only heal people who are on the verge of dying. I don't see Jacob as having involvement in this particular storyline. I connect it more directly to the island itself. So, was Aaron ever actually in danger if raised by another? Well, there is the most obvious reading that many have pointed out before. Aaron must not be raised by an other. As in, he must not be raised by the others. And as many fans already know, Ethan Rom is an anagram for other man. However, as much as that turn of phrase is pretty cute, if that's really what Malkin meant, then he wouldn't want Claire on the island at all. I mean, the others can only raise Aaron if Claire crashes there, and we know Aaron is in a lot of danger just being on the island, not just because people want to abduct him, but because being born and raised in the wild like this is not exactly safe. So I don't think Malkin understood all of this, nor did his conclusions need to be accurate. Like Desmond's flashes, they're not so much about accuracy as they are about motive power and getting characters to turn left instead of right. 
to say yes instead of no, to make choices that benefit the long-term game of destiny itself. The whole point of Malkin's visions and feelings were to get Claire on that plane, and his prime motivator was protecting the child. What is interesting is that we later see Aaron being raised by Kate off-island, and by all accounts Aaron seems absolutely fine here. The person who really suffers as a result of Aaron being raised by someone else is actually Claire. Losing Aaron sends her down a rabbit hole of anger and obsession in which she ultimately becomes unhinged and violent, and amenable to coercion by the man in black. Her dream way back in the first season foreshadows much of this trajectory that she goes on. So, perhaps Malkin misunderstood those warning signs. Maybe it wasn't Aaron who was in great danger if raised by another. Maybe it was his mother who was in great danger without her son. I'd like to move on to explore another type of psychic power we see portrayed on the show. This one comes in the form of characters being able to commune with the dead. Let's start by exploring Miles Strom. I need you to tell me why I'm this way. Our physical bodies anchor our souls to this plane of reality. Once the body dies, the soul has nothing left to hold on to anymore, and so it rejoins with the rest of the energy that first formed it. This is why Miles proclaims to Faraday, Whoa, 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 what are you doing with her? I'm taking her with us. What's the point? That's, that's not Naomi, it's just me. That's not Naomi. It's just meat. That's quite a thing to say. To Miles, when someone is dead, whatever made them the person they were is no longer there. And he knows this through his own experience with the dead. Some souls are not ready to let go of the living realm, and they cling on, sometimes because they have unfinished business, and other times because they won't allow themselves to move on. I don't really view this as a punishment from a higher power. It seems to me that it's more self-imposed, like we see with Ben, waiting outside the church. There's not some all-seeing, all-powerful entity holding him back from entering through those doors. The only thing that's keeping him from moving on is himself. I have some things that I still need to work out. I think I'll stay here a while. Whereas the ghosts that stay behind in the living realm are simply not ready to go through the sideways process at all. The sideways is a process all about accepting your own death and letting go of your life. More crucially, it's about accepting who you are and the things you've done. In the everyday world, these ghosts wait for the chance to express themselves in some way, but they need a medium in order to communicate. Enter Miles. He was born on the island, but was taken away during the incident of 1977. It is this channel's belief that Miles' early exposure to the light is what imbued him with his abilities. He is able to hear the voices of the dead, and he can access their memories on a read-only setting, much like the man in black can when he scans people and takes snapshots from their pasts. Miles can tap into this stream of consciousness from the afterlife, and pluck out information, usually the last thoughts and memories before the person died. We also learn that Miles can hear the dead without their remains being physically present, as evidenced by the scene in Season 4 episode Confirmed Dead, in which he does some ghost busting in a suburban house. You're not doing your grandmother any good staying here, man. You're causing her a lot of pain. I want to go downstairs and tell her you've gone. But the only way I'm going to be able to do that is if you tell me where it is. So where is it? It appears that Miles can tap into the afterlife's general broadcast, but he tunes into specific dead voices much better when their physical remains are present. We also know that proximity to electromagnetic energy amplifies the voices of the dead, as shown on the island and with the whispers. The machine that Miles is using in Confirmed Dead appears to generate some kind of charge in the room. We can assume that perhaps that charge is electromagnetic in nature. 
so it's most likely a device that helps to boost the signal of his gift in absence of a body, which allows him to get more out of his communion and zero in on specific details. I like to think that Miles could become more like Hurley if he honed his gift in a more open and honest way, but because he uses it cynically and for profit, he doesn't tap into his full potential. He remains a borderline psychic, and therefore limited in his abilities. Hugo Reyes Hurley developed his powers after leaving the island. It's possible that his powers were innate within him since childhood, and simply remained untapped. And it wasn't until his close proximity to the island and the source, and exposure to the light, that they were activated. Just like several other characters such as Miles, Desmond, and even Eloise. Some fans often wonder if Hurley's imaginary friend Dave was actually a ghost and if it was the first time that Hurley connected with the other side without realising it. A long-running fan theory also supposes that Dave might in fact be the ghost of Libby's late husband, David. However, for various reasons, this is not the case. Firstly, Hurley did not develop his ability to commune with the dead until after he left the island in 2004. It's made clear that the Dave we encounter during Hurley's flashbacks in Santa Rosa is merely a manifestation of Hurley's subconscious, part of his guilt complex that wants to self-punish. Hurley blamed himself and his weight for causing an accident that led to the death of several innocent people in a deck collapse, and this guilt manifests as an imaginary friend. Dave wants Hurley to keep eating and get bigger, in fact, imaginary Dave encourages many bad behaviours in Hurley, and does not appear at all representative of the decent, kind man that Libby once loved and grieved for. Why would Libby's David come to Hurley and want him to eat himself to death? And if Hurley was already talking to dead people pre-island, then why doesn't he encounter any more dead people? I think this connection was formed by fans, mostly because Libby said that her deceased husband's name was David. But lots of characters share overlapping names in Lost, just as they do in real life. David is a common name after all. Perhaps more crucially, David was the name of Hurley's dad, and if anything, that's where the name Dave comes from. When Hurley himself realises what Dave represents, he blocks him out. This is how he took steps towards getting better and eventually getting discharged from the facility altogether. Dave was not real. As for the Dave that appears to Hurley whilst on the island, I have discussed this manifestation in my video on ghosts and apparitions. That appearance is a little more ambiguous, but showrunner Damon Lindelof did confirm that it was not their intention for on-island Dave to be seen as a manifestation of the smoke monster. He's simply a more amplified version of Hurley's guilt complex. Once he is back in the world, much like several of his friends, Hurley begins to hear the island's broadcast. Jack sees visions of his dead father. Kate has dreams about the left behind Claire. And the messages that the island is sending Hurley also come in the form of familiar faces. This is because the island can call upon the souls of those who have died and already moved on, as we see with Charlie, Anna Lucia, Claudia, Isabella, and Jacob himself. These ghosts are, for lack of a better word, free. They have been through the sideways process and are effectively cleansed of their traumas and darkness, and they are called upon to help people in the living realm follow a certain path. We see this happen through Hurley as he speaks with various ghosts throughout the latter half of the series. All of them serve the same purpose, to guide him on his path back to the island and into becoming the new protector. First, we see Charlie appear to Hurley at Santa Rosa, with the specific request of getting Hugo back to the island. This is happening after the flash sideways process from Charlie's point of view. He has remembered his life, and his time on the island. He has remembered his love for Claire and Aaron. And he has remembered his ultimate sacrifice and death. He finds his soulmates again, then moves on into the light to rejoin with the source. But the island is summoning his consciousness back from this metaphysical state of being in order to help guide a key person back in the living realm. It's important to remember that both the living realm and the realm of the dead are interconnected and interdependent. 
The source is trying to ensure that it continues to flow out to the world and to maintain its own existence, and certain people such as Hurley are key players in making that happen. Anna Lucia's appearance at Hurley's car window is another example of the island using the dead to help Hurley get to where he needs to be. What's interesting about watching this scene back is how Anna Lucia is in uniform. It's the same uniform we see her wearing in the sideways, which means her visitation to Hurley is also happening after she has had her own awakening. We just don't see that happen on screen. Later, we see Hurley getting the hang of his gift and communicating more effectively with the dead back on the island, who appears to Hurley to essentially lead him by the hand through the endgame in order to help defeat the man in black. He also encounters Richard Alpert's Isabella. The island has called upon her to return from the source in order to put Richard back on the path he needs to be on, using Hurley as the spiritual translator between realms. Note Isabella's words to Richard. We are already together. This line is absolutely key to understanding where these non-whisper ghosts are coming from. In the flash sideways, once you have remembered your death and let go of the physical world, you move on into the light as a collective consciousness, in which we are all linked together, but time does not exist there. So Isabella can die in 1867, and Richard could die in, say, 2057, but they will both meet in the flash sideways and rejoin with the source at the same time. Therefore, Isabella is being summoned back to the living realm from this ethereal state beyond the flash sideways, where she is already with Richard, hence her words to him. That's because in this place, upon this Axis Mundi, the dead have a voice. We find out definitively what the whispers are in Season 6 episode, Everybody Loves Hugo. Wait. It's cool, I think I know what these things are. Oh yeah. What the hell are they? They are the voices of people who have died, who are trapped in a purgatory-like state. Although, it is a little bit more involved than that, because the Whispers have a long and complicated history behind the scenes. Damon Lindelof discussed this in an interview for a Comic-Con event in 2020. He talked about the various iterations of the Whispers throughout the show, and said the following. So the idea is that the Whispers is sometimes the monster, sometimes the actual ghosts of the island, and sometimes just a horrific story problem that we were trying to weasel our way out of. In other words, the Whispers were always in flux. The notion that they could sometimes be either ghosts or the Man in Black was quite the revelation, because this little nugget of information effectively opens up the field of analysis when looking at the Whispers. We know that the writers kept a back door open for multiple mysteries to have more than one possible answer during those first few seasons, and they were willing to adjust them depending on the needs of the story. So mythological touchstones like the Whispers, or the Sickness, definitely developed and evolved as the show progressed. Season 1 writer David Fury confirms as much. He said the following in an interview with Lostpedia about the Whispers. I can't tell you what they are now, but I can tell you what they were. They were supposed to be the Others, lurking in the jungle. At that time, we hadn't yet settled on what the Others would be. I think it's reasonable to assume that the writers weren't sure if the others were going to be supernatural in nature in Season 1. Ethan is even portrayed in an arguably semi-supernatural way, in terms of how strong he is and how he sneaks around and appears to people, and we can later see moments when the others and the whispers appear at the same time. So, the history behind this mystery is complicated, and so are people's feelings on the ultimate answer that was given. But let's look at the show itself and try to dispel certain misconceptions about the Whispers predominantly being associated with the others, which is something that I see a lot. The Whispers appeared approximately 20 times throughout the course of the series, but only four of those times did they ever actually overlap with appearances from the others. Four times out of at least 20. I say at least because there is debate over what is considered an actual whisper versus more subtle occurrences of sound effects that might not actually be voices. When Jack, Kate, Sawyer and Hurley are trekking across the island with Michael in the season 2 finale, they hear the whispers and then the others attack. 
This is the first time the others ever actually appear at the same time as the Whispers. In season 4, Juliet encounters the Whispers when she runs into Harper in the jungle. This is only the second time we see others associated with Whispers, and Harper's appearance remains ambiguous in this scene. More on that in a bit. Kimi and his team hear Whispers before the others attack them, and this is the third time Whispers coincide with an appearance from the others. Finally, Jack's group hear the whispers beneath the temple before they are captured by the others, and this is the fourth and final time there was any direct overlap or correlation. It's also worth highlighting that Ben mentions the whispers in Season 5 episode Dead is Dead. He warns Russo with the following. Now you listen to me. If you try to follow me, or if you ever come looking for me, I'll kill you. And if you want your child to live, every time you hear whispers, you run the other way. Now, he doesn't exactly say what they are or where they come from. The connection between the others and whispers is inferred by Russo as a result of Ben's statement. And this is why she tells Saeed years later. But I hear them. Out there, in the jungle. Whisper. The whispers mostly seem to reside in the jungle, and Ben knows this, and he uses them as a way to scare Rousseau off from exploring the island any further. The moment she hears whispers, she runs, and this is why she never discovered the things that our losties did. For 16 years, she was kept to the fringes of the island. Anyway, by season 3 the writers room had settled on the others being a technologically advanced community, so they started to leave behind the idea that the others were producing the whispers, and we see that happen as the series goes on. In fact, once we find out more about the others, the idea that people like Tom Friendly and Juliet Burke are hiding in the jungle and whispering random phrases to spook our losties is almost laughable. The whispers actually appear more times in connection with supernaturally adjacent events, or appearances of dead people, or the man in black. And the hints that these whispers were supernatural in origin were baked into the show from pretty much the beginning. You can find detailed transcripts of the whispers online, although there are many alternate translations out there. Remember, many of these transcripts are fan-generated and are based on best guesses. Most of the whispers are without any real relevant context and are often a mix of random gibberish and fragmented observations on what is happening on screen. But there is one very telling audible line in the mix. It was the first real clue that the whispers were the voices of the dead, and it came as early as season one in the episode Outlaws. The last words of the man Sawyer shot and killed in Sydney, aka Frank Duckett, echo out in the jungle as Sawyer hunts down the boar. The whisper clearly says, it'll come back around. This could either be the voice of Sawyer's victim, or it could simply be one of the ghosts repeating the phrase, knowing what Sawyer did. Or we can attribute this moment, and Sawyer's bore, as even being the man in black. Other instances in which the whispers could have been coming from the man in black rather than the actual ghosts of the island are when Anna Lucia's group run into Shannon. The only reason that Anna Lucia is trigger happy in that moment is because she has heard the whispers stirring in the jungle, and she has mistaken them for being the others and it is these voices that lead her into shooting Shannon. Sure, Shannon was following Walt's apparition, but Anna Lucia fired because she was reacting to the whispers. And then there is Harper Stanhope, who could possibly be a Man in Black manifestation, although this is never confirmed and still remains theoretical. The whispers signal her arrival, and she goes on to instruct Juliet to kill two people, Faraday and Charlotte, 
who we later find out are candidates on Jacob's list. Sometimes the whispers come at a point that leads different groups of characters into conflict with one another. We see this happen between Jack's group and the others in the valley. Then later when Kimi's team are ambushed by the others in the jungle. Could these encounters be the man in black trying to stir up some conflict, or are they simply island ghosts congregating to watch events unfold? I think you can really read these moments as being either. Later, we hear whispers before the man in black appears to Michael on the freighter, and again when Sun and Frank are at the barracks, moments before they meet fake Christian. These particular instances can absolutely be read as smoke monster related, which makes sense because the Man in Black has been many dead people over the centuries, and contains all of their personalities and voices within his dark cloud. However, they could also be ghosts trying to warn people that the Man in Black is coming. I actually prefer that interpretation, because that way we don't necessarily need to distinguish between whether the voices are coming from the smoke monster, or if they are coming from actual ghosts, because maybe the whispers are simply drawn to the man in black. After all, he walks among them, but he is not one of them. They know he is a bringer of death and destruction, all the things that made these ghosts what they are now. And let's not forget that potentially many of the ghosts trapped on the island were killed by the man in black, or through his machinations and manipulations. These ghosts are gravitating towards him, towards conflict, violence and death, particularly in the jungle. They don't seem to hang out on the beach very much. They are very much concentrated within the central hub of the island, much like the smoke monster. There are also times when they show up that aren't connected at all to appearances of the man in black or to any specific conflict. These moments fall more in line with ghosts observing events or trying to reach out to the living. Saeed hears the voices in the jungle on his way back to camp. We hear Christian Shepherd's voice whispering to Jack on the intercom in the Hydra. What? Let it go. Young Ben sees the ghost of his mother in the jungle, who seems to emerge from the cacophony of overlapping whispers. He later hears them again before he meets Richard Alpert. Almost every psychic appearance of Walt is also accompanied by whispering too, but I'll come back to this idea shortly. Either way, the whispers always made more sense as being supernatural in origin than any real-world explanation. Due to the close proximity of the source, the voices of the dead are amplified on the island, which means everyday people can hear them speak, even if the voices only come through in the form of overlapping whispers. Many of these voices are those who have died on the island and simply find themselves trapped within the island's electromagnetic bubble. They are unable to let go and move on until they have served their purpose. They frequently show up whenever the possibility of death approaches, or when key people are alone. It appears that they are always trying to talk to the living in some way. To warn us. To help us. To guide us. If only we could understand what they were saying. Michael Dawson becomes a key representative of the Whispers in the final season. He is slightly different to Hurley's off-island visitors in that he is anchored to the island, and he has yet to go through the sideways process of letting go. Before he can do that, he needs to reconcile with his son in the living realm, in part because Walt still has a destiny ahead of him that needs to play out. The only reason we can see Michael and understand what he's saying in Season 6 is because we are seeing him from Hurley's point of view. Michael demonstrates an understanding of what is happening, and more importantly, what needs to happen. For the Man in Black to be destroyed and the island to be saved, Hurley must lead his friends to the Man in Black's camp, and if they blow up the plane now, there will be no chance for our remaining Losties to escape at a pivotal moment later. He seems to be observing events, like all the Whispers are. 
What I find particularly fascinating when looking back at this part of the show is the idea of time no longer having meaning after you die, which means Michael's ghost might not be restricted by linear time, like he was when he was alive, which might also mean whenever he heard the whispers in previous seasons, for example when he was with the tail section survivors. What the hell is that? And then again on the freighter. Who are you? This moment is of course foreshadowing what Michael is about to become, but maybe he is actually hearing himself in there somewhere. It's possible that Ghost Michael is watching himself in the past and seeing himself make the same mistakes over and over. And this theory can extend itself to other instances on the show, particularly in relation to Walt. Whenever he appears in astral form, his manifestations are accompanied by whispers. One interpretation could be that because he is using the source's frequency to broadcast, it's the same channel that the ghosts communicate on. We also see them whirl around Locke as he prepares to kill himself, just before Walt appears to prevent him from going through with it. If we read Walt's appearances as really being Walt, then it signals to us that there is a connection between him and the afterlife. A connection that might only make sense by the final season. What if Ghost Michael is there for all of his son's appearances? It's a cool context to apply when looking back at these particular scenes, and helps to enrich them a little bit more. Michael attempted to redeem himself for the murders of Anna Lucia and Libby by sacrificing his life to save others with the bomb on the freighter. However, he never got to resolve the relationship that was most important to him by earning his son's forgiveness for those murders. In the series epilogue The New Man in Charge, we see Hurley and Ben bringing Walt back to the island with the strong implication that he is going to help his father move on into the light. You have work to do. Starting with helping your father. My father's dead. Doesn't mean you can't help him. I think the Whisper Ghosts on the island still have the opportunity to find closure in their post-death state, like Michael. And that closure might take any number of forms. These ghosts watch events unfold on the island across time, presumably as if they were lost within a dream that they cannot wake up from. This channel believes that no ghost remains behind without serving a purpose in the grand tapestry of time, no matter where or how they died. They are there to guide, nudge, or push the living in a certain direction. Still, the question remains, why do some people die and become whispers and others don't? People quite rightly wonder why someone like Ben doesn't become a whisper due to all the bad he did in his life, whereas Michael, a father who committed a horrible crime out of desperation to save his son, does. Well, Ben doesn't become a whisper on the island because everyone he needs to make peace with had already died before him, often at his own hands. People such as his father, Roger Linus, his adopted daughter, Alex Russo, her real mother, Danielle Russo, and even his successor, John Locke, and predecessor, Charles Widmore. All of them had died before him, so the only way he could make peace with his actions was through the flash sideways and interactions with these people. Since we've already started to peel back the layers of the flash sideways, let's get into the metaphysics of it all. Why it exists, how it works, and what it means. The term flash sideways was coined in the writer's room as a way to differentiate between flashbacks and flash forwards. It was their way of explaining to fans that what we are seeing in season 6 are neither taking place in the past nor the future, but instead taking place alongside everything. At the time when season 6 first aired, the flash sideways was assumed to be a parallel timeline, hence its name. But I think the term really means that we are glimpsing these characters from a new vantage point in a place that exists beyond the living realm, 
and in order to see them there, we have to look a little bit sideways. Everything we see happening in the Flash sideways takes place somewhere between the point of death and the afterlife. It's not an alternate timeline, nor is it set in the living realm. Everything happening in the show outside of the Sideways universe is reality as we know it, in which actions have consequences and the stakes are incredibly real. When we die, our inner light returns to the source, and we find ourselves within a sort of fourth dimensional junction in which all souls intersect with one another. Before we can fully rejoin with the energy that gave us life, we must first let go of the life we knew, and come to terms with our own death. So the Flash Sideways is a construct, a way to help people ease into this new plane of existence. Think of the Sideways universe as being almost like a shared dream, populated entirely by the consciousnesses of every person that ever existed. It will look different to people who died in different eras, because it's always a subjective reflection of the world that each person remembers, or finds the most familiar. What we are seeing in Season 6 is our Losties, very own specific corner of this reality that they create for themselves in order to find each other in death. Much like a lost and found section in an airport, where people are reunited with their missing items and lost baggage, before they leave through the exit. But before they can walk out, a person needs to understand what exactly is inside their respective baggage. Every character has something that they need to accept, experience, or reckon with before they can move on into the light for rebirth. What exactly that rebirth will entail is left entirely up to the imagination of the viewer. It could be reincarnation, or transcending to a higher state of consciousness. Whatever happens after that church fills with light is entirely down to your preferred interpretation. Damon Lindelof has gone on record as talking about how the Sideways was inspired by the Tibetan Book of the Dead, and the concept of the Bardo, which is worth reading up on to see what the writers were going for. The Google definition states, Used without qualification, Bardo is the state of existence intermediate between two lives on Earth. According to Tibetan tradition, after death and before one's next birth, when one's consciousness is not connected with a physical body, one experiences a variety of phenomena. For certain souls, the bardo offers a state of great opportunity for liberation, while for others it can become a place of danger, as karmically created hallucinations can impede or prevent one from achieving transcendence and rebirth. In an interview with Collider, Lindelof further explains, And so, we all liked the idea in the Tibetan Book of the Dead, the idea of the bardo, which was, you know, and I'm overly simplifying a vastly complex um, uh, uh, construct. But the idea of the bardo is, is like, it's a place that you go when you die, but you don't know that you're dead. And the entire purpose of being in this space is to come to the revelation that you have died, but no one's allowed to tell you. And so we were like, oh God, that would be a really cool way, thing to do in the final season. But people will know what we're up to unless we make them think it's something else. Is there so, can we disguise it as like a, as a time travel paradox? And so that, that basically led to us backing into season five so that the incident would end season five. And so when you started to get presented with, you know, Oceanic 815 flying over a sunken island, your brain would tell you, oh, this is a parallel timeline. There are actually many clues throughout Season 6 that indicate the Sideways is taking place in the afterlife. In the Sideways, the blood that keeps reappearing on Jack's neck is a subconscious reminder of where the man in black began to cut his throat. Then there is Juliet's final words and thoughts to Sawyer before she dies. I could get coffee sometime. I gotta get you out of here. We can go touch. I should get coffee sometime. I'd love to, but the machine ate my daughter. I only got one left. We can go touch. As Juliet's consciousness transitions itself into the sideways, Miles picks up on it when communing with her remains. What? The word. What did she want to tell? That's what she wanted to tell you. 
It worked. What worked? Oops. <laughs> I worked. It worked has nothing to do with changing the past or the future. Juliet is simply seeing into the sideways. Her dying body's consciousness is connecting from the living world to the sideways world. The series finale makes these connections even more clear by showing us that Juliet's dying words were coming from the scene taking place by the vending machine. It worked as a reference to the fact that her trick with the vending machine worked, and her references to going Dutch weren't just random gibberish popping into her head before she died. It was Sideways Juliet asking Sideways Sawyer out on a date. This is much the same thing that later happens to Desmond. When Desmond gets blasted by the electromagnetic energy by Charles Widmore, his consciousness moves into the sideways for a few moments. Initially, we assume that he has somehow entered the parallel dimension in which Oceanic 815 never crashed. However, in reality, Desmond's consciousness has glimpsed beyond death for a brief moment to experience the afterlife. He has gone beyond space and time. What Desmond experiences in the episode Happily Ever After is actually a near-death experience also known as an NDE. How long was I unconscious for? Well, no more than a few seconds. This experience of the sideways is what empowers Desmond going forward. His fear, his cowardice, his anger are all bled away because he sees that there is a future awaiting all of them where things work out. Other clues along the way included the visual concept of reflections, characters looking into mirrors. The reflections are a reminder of their true selves. The mirrors provide a window back into the living world. Everyone ultimately goes through the sideways subjectively. Our main characters experience this dreamlike construct as an alternate 2004 because that year had great significance to them as a group. It is the year that they all came together as soulmates in the living world. And as previously discussed, for someone like Richard Alpert, he is nowhere to be seen, most likely because he is experiencing his own sideways as an alternate 1867, in which he and Isabella are together, where she never died of pneumonia, and where they can live in a reconstruction of their lives together, without conflict, until they are both ready to move on. It will be different for every person that experiences it, and it all depends on what time you died in, and who was most connected to you. All souls will pass through the sideways. It's not an exclusive place for the Oceanic 815 survivors. I think that's quite a common misconception. Christian claims that this is the place they all made together, and I think people assume that that means the sideways itself. Yet there are many characters not in the church at the end who we know are not just imaginary projections, but real people, real souls, such as Benjamin Linus, Alexandra and Danielle Rousseau, Anna Lucia Cortez, Daniel Faraday and Charlotte Lewis, Miles Strom, Charles Widmore and Eloise Hawking, plus many others. These characters are all the real people from the living world, but they are not ready to move on yet. They will eventually find their way back to the light with other people from their lives who meant the most to them, their own soulmates. I think Christian's line is more in reference to the church itself. The church is the place that this group subconsciously created so that they could find each other and transcend together. It's their little corner of this collective dream space within the source which is why they all know how to find it on instinct and without direction. Let's look at Jack Shepard's journey through the sideways to get a better sense of what is happening. His entire life led him towards saving the island and the world in 2007. His destiny was to become a protector, vanquish the man in black, and restart the heart of the island. Jack found and fulfilled his destiny, Yet there were still loose ends from his life that went unfulfilled and unresolved. He never got to reconcile with his father, 
a man who was the chief antagonist throughout most of his life. He also never got to be a father himself, or at least to become the kind of father he always wished he could have had. Jack internalised so much of his father's views and assessments and judgments of him. I don't know how to help them. I'll fail. I'll... I don't have what it takes. You don't want to be a hero. You don't want to try and save everyone. Because when you fail... You just don't have what it takes. So The Flash Sideways provides Jack with this opportunity to know what it is like to have a child. To raise him, to support him, and to get it right. You know, when I was your age, my father didn't want to see me fail either. He used to say to me that... He said that I didn't have what it takes. I spent my whole life carrying that around with me. I don't ever want you to feel that way. I will always love you. No matter what you do, it, in my eyes, you can never fail. I just want to be a part of your life. As for who David Shepard really was, we can only really speculate. There are, as I see it, only two possible explanations for his existence in the sideways. The first one is that David is a construct from Jack's subconscious. He looks and behaves just as Jack did when he was that age. The boy is a direct reflection of his younger self, created in order to help Jack be the good father he never got to be in real life. This way Jack can do for his younger self what Christian Shepherd never did when he was growing up. It's a way of reaching a catharsis that he could not achieve in life, which is why David is encouraged and supported in his musical pursuits with piano playing, something that's implied that Jack might have done had he not been driven into the family business to prove his worth. David is there to help Jack understand what it's like to be a father, so that he fulfills the role he never got to play, which in turn helps him to understand and forgive his own father. And if David is also the younger version of Jack, then David is also a literal part of Jack's subconscious, which means Jack is experiencing the sideways via both versions of himself. So he isn't just getting to be the father, he's also getting to be the son again. I think it's worth noting that Lindelof actually validated this theory on an episode of the Storm podcast. He said that David was intended to be a representation of young Jack. Sometimes it feels good to have your ideas validated. However, there is a popular fan theory that has been floating around ever since the show ended. The theory goes that David Shepard is in fact Jack's real son, by way of Kate. Before they return to the island in 2007, Jack and Kate spend the night together and make love. It would be then that Kate becomes pregnant. She returns to the island and events play out as seen, and it isn't until after she leaves the island and Jack dies that she will realise she is with his child. This theory would mean that David Shepard is as real as anyone else in the sideways, and is getting to know the father he never had. This option does raise questions, however. Why would David have no interactions with Kate, his alleged mother, and why would he not be in the church at the end? These are valid questions, and the only one which can really be answered is why David isn't in the church. There are many characters of great importance to the lives of our losties who are not there in the end. Locke moves on without the love of his life Helen by his side, even though she has made appearances in the sideways. Hurley's parents are absent from the church too. As is Charlie's brother Liam, someone who was instrumental in the kind of person Charlie became. Juliet's sister Rachel is also absent, and she was a key relationship for Juliet in the living realm. There are many, many others too. The reason for why certain family members or loved ones are absent from the church is because moving on is not necessarily about family or friends. You will get to see them in the afterlife and interact with them in various forms, but the actual process of moving on is about something deeper, 
something more spiritual. No one rejoins with the source alone. You move into the light with your soulmates. Now by soulmates I don't necessarily mean it in the romantic sense of the word. This transcends the relationships of the everyday world we live in. The amount of time you spend with someone or how well you knew them becomes immaterial. What matters is how you are connected beyond the physical and the literal. Soulmates in the sideways sense simply means the people you were bound together with by fate and destiny in the living world. Take Jack as the prime example. The light within him was bound to the people he met on the island, not just through their shared experiences there together, but because they were all connected by the island and its grand tapestry of time. Their fates were entwined, regardless of flesh and blood, or language and nationality, or gender, ethnicity or religion. There was never a point in their lives where they weren't going to meet each other and have these experiences. In spiritual philosophy, soulmates transcends the concept of family and friends. They are considered to be people with whom you may have lived many lifetimes together with in different states of being, regardless of your relationships to one another. And this is the implication for our losties. Some of them had shared experiences in life. But then some went on to have shared experiences beyond anything we ever see in the show. But just because someone like Shannon had no real world living connection to someone like Penny, doesn't mean they are not connected by the same people, the same place, the same love, and the same light. Each of their light creates one piece of a collective whole. I feel this is the philosophy that the show is trying to convey to us in those final scenes. What's interesting is that we see the sideways as populated by many different souls, all of whom are on their own journeys, some of whom we recognise from their connections to the island, and some of whom are merely strangers passing through the same dream and occasionally interacting, just as Yemi did with Charlotte Malkin in her sideways universe. They too will come to terms with their own deaths and move on into the light with their own soulmates. We get a sense of this with Benjamin Linus. He sits outside the church not ready to move on, in part because he is not reconciled with his actions on the living plane, but also because the group inside the church are not necessarily his soulmates in which his life was most deeply entwined with. Ben must help his own people remember and seek their forgiveness before rejoining with the source. He begins this process by apologising to John Locke and seeking forgiveness, of which he is granted. After this, Ben will no doubt seek the forgiveness of Alex and her mother, helping them to remember their lives. After all, it isn't just love and joy that helps people to remember their lives, it's also pain and loss and grief and regret. The emotions that we felt the most strongly during life. Once Ben has made peace with himself and those he wronged, he will be able to move on with them. Now a question that is quite often asked about the rules of the Sideways universe is what happens to the people who appear to die in it. I mean we do see villains such as Martin Kimi, his right hand man Omar, and even Mikhail get killed. What does this actually mean within the context of the afterlife? Well, cast your minds back to Dogen's scale of balance within people his seemingly metaphorical concept that represents the idea of morality within human beings. For every man there is a scale. On one side of the scale there is good. On the other side, evil. And now let's take Martin Kimi as an example of that scale. His inner light turned to darkness during his life. The balance within him slid too far in the wrong direction. He did not attempt to make contrition for his bad deeds, nor did he ever attempt to redeem his actions in life. So in the sideways universe, someone like Kimi is still reckoning with that darkness inside of himself. He is in denial about his own death in the same way that everyone else is, but his own soulmate or soulmates are not nearly as clear to him as they might be to our losties. And he cannot remember who he was or what he did without finding those connections and making peace with the memories of his life. Regardless, death does not function the same way in the sideways as it does in reality. In fact, death has no dominion at all in the sideways, so that means there are two possibilities of what happens to people like Kimi after they have been, quote, killed, end quote. The first is that they die and then reset like a video game character. 
reliving the exact same sequence of events in the sideways as they have before. Much like Groundhog Day, they are stuck in a never-ending loop from which they cannot escape, almost like a karmic punishment for all the wrong they did. I suppose this would be very much in keeping with the notions of what hell would be like. The second possibility is that they wake up again in a different scenario and will be given different choices. After he is shot, Kimi could wake up in the sideways again, but experience different people and places from his life. Like Saeed, he could be offered the chance to find the connections to his humanity once again, and to make amends for any wrong he caused. Perhaps with the help of someone from his past, long before his light had turned to darkness. It is these final choices in the sideways that will determine if they are ready to return to the light or not. As we see with Anna Lucia, some people are simply not quite ready to do that just yet, and certainly not ready to sit alongside our losties. Something is holding them back, or they have yet to reconnect with the right person, and remember. Some move on in their own way, such as Mr Echo and his brother Yemi, who don't need anyone else. They were the most important people in each other's lives, and had the strongest bond. Meanwhile, others will move on after the church group has departed. The sideways hasn't ceased to exist just because they have gone into the light. We know there are several characters that have been left behind. Time doesn't matter within the sideways any more than it does when you're inside a dream. Circling back to this idea of death in the sideways and the potential notion of hell, nothing really captures this more clearly than when we look at someone like John Locke's father, Anthony Cooper. This is the closest we ever see to a clear version of what hell would be like in the Lost Universe. He's in a catatonic state, akin to locked-in syndrome, where he is aware of his environment but unable to interact with it. One interpretation as to why he is like this is that it's possible Cooper remembered all of the awful things he did to people throughout his life, and it's possible that his actions proved to be too much for him to take, therefore trapping him inside himself in this catatonic state. Which means Anthony Cooper cannot seek forgiveness or find soulmates, if indeed he ever had any in the first place. It might even be the case that a person without soulmates cannot move on. If you lived a life without any love or connection, then you could forever be stuck in this purgatory state, which means people like Cooper are indeed trapped in hell. And whether or not he will ever be able to escape this prison of the soul is unclear. Like Kimi, we can only hypothesise what happens to the seemingly irredeemable. Let's imagine that Cooper, quote, dies, unquote, within this locked-in state. He could potentially reawaken again in the same sideways loop, or in a completely different scenario. This is something that the show leaves entirely open to speculation. We know that the sideways is incredibly symbolic and not always literal, and that's what makes it so fascinating, because it opens itself up to varied interpretations depending on your point of view, and that's ultimately what the Flash sideways boils down to. Point of view. Reflections in a mirror of one's self-image. Remembrances of a life from inside a dream from self-actualization to collective catharsis. But each person has to find their own way to the church first, because the way they experience the sideways is entirely subjective. Therefore, their path towards enlightenment will be deeply personal, and we only ever see the sideways from the perspective of our losties, and their specific perceptions of themselves and one another. A good example of this subjectivity is in how Aaron is portrayed. His rebirth occurs in the sideways, and this helps Claire, Kate, and Charlie to remember who they really are. His presence is a galvanising moment for all three souls. This also holds true for other characters like Jack Shepard, since their memories of the island would sync up directly to when Aaron was just a newborn baby there, as it will for many of the other characters in the church. When Jack walks into the room at the end, we are seeing the people within it through his eyes. As viewers, we should not be limited by the illusion that the rules of reality still apply in this place. We can be certain that Aaron lived a full life of his own, growing up and growing old. Kate presumably died an old woman, yet we see her in here just as she was on the island, and that is true for all of the characters. 
So to someone like Aaron, he might perceive being in that church as a grown man, surrounded by his own soulmates, and maybe he sees his own mother Claire as an old woman. The point is that the Sideways is presenting this dream reality to its occupants in a way that will best help them to let go and move on. For Jack, it is seeing his soulmates as he remembered them on the island. An alternative perspective in the church could see an adult Aaron standing alongside the second generation of Losties, including Gion, Clementine, Little Charlie, and even Walt. That's what's so great about it, it's incredibly interpretive. And if you study the continuity of what's happening in that church scene, various characters are interacting in different combinations from shot to shot. Finally, we need to talk about why the island is underwater at the beginning of Season 6. The Sideways presents us with an alternative construct of the world in 2004, a 2004 in which the island never interfered with nor reconfigured the destinies of our Oceanic 815 characters. The island being at the bottom of the ocean is largely symbolic because its influence on each character's life is very specific, so by taking it out of the picture, it creates ripple effects in everyone's lives, which will be different for each person. However, that's not to say that the island simply doesn't exist in the sideways at all. We see it at the bottom of the ocean just as it was in the real 2004. Let's look at the island underwater in that opening scene of LAX. Everything on it is still there. The Dharma barracks, the remnants of the Towerit statue with four toes, Everything just as it was up to at least 1977, which means the island history technically happened in the sideways. It's just a slightly alternative history, because our Oceanic 815 characters never interacted with events there, which includes, drumroll please, the causal time travel events. So, young Ben was never shot by Saeed and the incident was never prevented from happening because there was no Juliet or Jughead to stop it. Which means Roger and Ben would have been evacuated along with everyone else in this alternative 1977, and they would have gotten off the island. The island sinks as a result of our Oceanic 815ers not being there to stop it. Had this happened in the real 1977, the world would have ended. But that no longer matters in the sideways, because everyone is already dead. Anyway, Ben and Roger now remember this alternate series of sideways events. This construct is preventing them from remembering their true lives, in which Roger became an abusive father and Ben killed him years later. Instead, they experience their lives had the island not entangled them in its tapestry of time, just like everyone else. And, as a result of that island absence, they get to experience a close father-son bond and relationship. Every character in the Sideways has a grounding in that actual, real-world history. The island had major influence on various aspects of their lives and decisions, all of which fed into the Tapestry of Time. They could not be picked apart from that tapestry in life, but in death, their lives diverge off from what actually happened to them, so we can see what could have been without Jacob or the island's influence and we see that these people were soulmates who would have crossed paths and affected one another's lives regardless. They were connected in both life and in death. Time has no meaning where they are now. They are beyond time, beyond history. Reality is all relative. And all that matters to them in this final phase of letting go is finding each other, their constants. In Happily Ever After, the show draws a direct connection between the realities. Desmond's experiences on the island influence his experiences in the sideways, and his experiences in the sideways influence his choices on the island. In the sideways, no one remembers their true lives or their deaths until they are ready to move on, and they don't remember the island or their experiences on it either, so the island remains hidden deep beneath the vast ocean of their collective subconscious waiting to be rediscovered, waiting to be remembered. The ultimate message of Lost is a simple idea that we are all connected by time and fate, through light and darkness, and in life and in death.
I think there is some truth to the idea that certain people were turned off from Lost because it leaned into its mystical ideas and spiritual themes, and essentially validated the Man of Faith argument come the final season, at least to a large extent. But there were others in the audience who were turned off from the sci-fi elements in season 5, as it was starting to get very heavy with the time travel and the pseudoscience, which is something I actually personally enjoyed the most. Basically, there were people that were alienated by the show's eventual direction, and which side of the argument that it eventually came down on. Some people really came to dislike the show because of this, but I'd argue that the show was rooted in concepts of destiny and spirituality right from the very beginning, especially when we consider episodes such as Walkabout and the John Locke character. Season 1 established very early on that some kind of magic was at play in this story, Locke being able to walk again, and ghosts appearing on the island, cemented that fact. The idea of redemption for past sins was a heavy theme throughout that first season. If anything, the science-based stuff was nowhere to be seen back then, not until season 2 introduced Dharma. And the idea of fate being the overarching theme of the series was outright stated in the season 1 finale, during that classic Jack vs Locke argument on the way out to the hatch. It's destiny. Locke's rallying cry of, everything is happening for a reason, made more sense than Jack's defiant rebuke of, this is all coincidence and meaningless, destiny isn't real. Had the show ended up proving season 1 Jack right, then the writers would have had a hard time selling that. Imagine if season 6 had revealed that everything turned out to be a Dharma experiment gone wrong. That wouldn't have matched with what had been set up for five seasons beforehand. Lost was a spiritual show, about the nature of fate and interlinked destinies, right from its very inception. I think it did leave enough elements ambiguous around the nature of the light, so that various interpretations can be read from it. Is it supernatural? Or science? Or both? Can science explain faith? In my previous video on science and time travel, I discuss how the numbers are a great example of that. What I like about how the show wrestles with these questions is that it calls into question the idea of human agency, and how we define our own purpose in life. It's the question that lies at the heart of all philosophy. What is the point of life? Does anything we do matter? And Lost supplies us with its own answer. Yes, everything we do matters. Even the worst events in the world and in our lives have meaning and purpose. We are all part of one story, and one consciousness. The notion of agency and choice is always subjective. It's far more complicated than saying, you're in control of your own life, or you're being controlled by a higher power. Neither of those statements are entirely true within the Lost Universe. Yes, determinism may be at the heart of the plot, but that doesn't mean people were not making choices. And I think the finale in the church is often interpreted as being overtly religious in nature, and somehow undoing the man of science argument entirely. But I don't subscribe to that reading of it at all. Yes, it is a spiritual ending to a clearly spiritual show, but the science is a valid way of reading the outcome. Because we can look at the light in the way that Mother understood it, as this powerful, magic, elemental light. Or we can look at it the way Daniel Faraday understood the light as electromagnetic energy, and exotic matter. Ultimately, either interpretation is valid, but they both agree on one thing. The light is an elemental force that has the power to make or unmake our reality. I'll leave you with this example. In the flash sideways, our losties gather at the church where they are consumed by the light. In the real world, this church houses the lamppost station underground. In other words, Faith is above, but science is beneath it. Science and faith explain the same thing in different ways, and this is what is at the heart of both the island and of Lost as a mythology. And it's why we still continue to actively discuss and debate it all these years later. The show accomplished what it set out to do. A person lives. They play their part in the grand tapestry of time. They die in service of whatever their destiny may have been. They go to the Flash sideways to remember this life and find their soulmates. They move on into the light together to rejoin with the source that gave them life in the first place. And the source calls upon them when needed to make sure this cycle is perpetuated across time. 
Those that are not ready to go on this journey stay behind to whisper to the living, until their time comes to be released, so that they can find the peace they need in the light, with the rest of us. Thank you for watching. Please be sure to like, share, and subscribe to keep this channel alive. Also, check out my Patreon, which allows people to support the channel and my work here more directly. In the sixth and final part of this Theory of Everything series, we shall be exploring the meaning of Lost, including its themes, its impact, and opening up the magic box itself to see what lies within it. Thank you for watching. Until the next time, stay lost.